Well, uh, thank you, Abby, and, and, and other folks who helped organize this. So it's my pleasure to welcome our, our special guest, Anna Hatch. She is the program director for the Declaration on Research Assessment, otherwise known as DORA. Um, at DORA, she works with the academic community to address biases and advance practical and robust approaches to research assessment globally. And is just a little bit of setup for this session. Um, the University Library is a signatory and supporter of DORA. And just, I think it was the fall before the pandemic, uh, Anna had invited uh, me and Guru Rao, uh, who's also here with us today, to take part in a, a workshop on DORA at the Howard Hughes uh, Medical Institute. And uh, Guru and I came back from that uh, fairly energized. We had some some ideas about how we might jumpstart a conversation on DORA and research assessment reform on campus. Um, and then a pandemic hit, retirements hit, normal, just crazy busy work life hit, and uh, the, the wind that we had in our sails uh, was, was deflated. So our hope today is that uh, we'll get an update on some of the, the great work that Anna and Dora have been doing. They've been developing uh, tools and resources to help out exactly with trying to get this type of conversation started on campuses just like ours. So with that, uh, Anna, the, the floor is yours. And thank you very much for being here. Uh, thank you so much. Go ahead and start sharing my screen. Right. Lovely. And you guys can all see the slides okay? Perfect. Thank you, Abby. Um, so delighted to be here today. Um, like Curtis said, I'm the program director for DORA. Um, we are an international nonprofit initiative to improve the ways that researchers are assessed in academic, academia. Um, we're supported by 16 organizations, including the library at Iowa State, um, but also other research funders, publishers, and scholarly societies. Um, so what I was thinking for today is I have some questions that I wanted to talk about and hoping that I can give a little sort of you know, presentation or introduction, then we can pause for some Q and A um, or general discussion. And the majority of what I'd like to spend our time talking about is a new tool that Dora released this summer called Space to Evolve Academic Assessment. And it's a resource that can support institutional change at academic institutions um, by really sort of capturing, you know, what is the state of play at the institution? And then figuring out, you know, what is the best way to strengthen some of our capabilities to create lasting change. Um, but just to get started, a little bit of background on what exactly is DORA. So since the declaration was released in 2013, more than 20,000 individuals and organizations have signed it in 148 countries. And I think this really speaks to the need um, that there's a global recognition to really reimagine how we evaluate ac academics. Um, and the declaration itself calls for the elimination of journal-based metrics in hiring, promotion, and funding decisions. But it also recommends that organizations be explicit about the criteria used to evaluate researchers and instead really take a holistic approach to assessment by considering the value and impact of all academic outputs. Uh, we know that journal articles are not the only academic output. Um, so also looking at things like contributions to society, contributions to teaching and mentorship, contributions to equity and inclusion. And the declaration, I really sort of like its genesis story um, because it came out of a discussion with researchers and scholarly um, publishers at the annual meeting for the American Society for Cell Biology. Um, it happened in 2012. It was held in San Francisco, and that's why we're often called to the San Francisco Declaration on Research Assessment. Um, I'm actually based out of Washington, DC. <laughs> so they were having a conversation at this conference about you know, what the journal impact factor was doing to research culture. Um, and specifically how it was being misused in hiring and promotion um, and funding decisions and really the effects that that was having on 
researcher behavior, um, how research was being or conducted, so thinking about research integrity. Um, and of course, sort of the main part of this conversation was that, you know, the journal impact factor as a metric doesn't provide information about the quality or impact of an individual researcher or article. It really speaks to journal performance. So then why is that being applied in these types of decisions? And so after that conversation, the declaration was published in a couple months later in 2013. And for about five years, it was raising awareness and collecting signatures. And then at the end of 2017, a group of organizations came together and said, you know what, <laughs> the declaration was very successful at raising awareness, but raising awareness doesn't always lead to culture change. So what can we do to really support culture change for research assessment? And the answer to that sort of came from turning DORA into a declaration to an active initiative. And that's how we see ourselves now as an international initiative to support change. And our vision then really is to sort of advance practical and robust approaches to research assessment reform, you know, around the world and across all disciplines. And specifically, we aim to do this by raising awareness of fair and responsible research assessment, facilitating the implementation of new policies and practices, and in doing so, catalyzing change in academia and improving equity. So that's just a little bit about sort of what DORA is. I'm happy to take any questions now if you have any. Um, and if not, I can sort of move into discussions about, well, why, why, why might we need responsible assessment? All right, I'm not seeing any hands raised, so I'll continue on. Um, but if there is someone who wants to jump in, just feel free to unmute yourself. <laughs> okay, so why might we need responsible assessment? And I alluded to this before, but journal-based metrics have an outsized influence on decisions that impact research careers. Um, so there was a study conducted by Aaron McKiernan and colleagues that found in the United States and Canada, 40% of institutions at research intensive institution, 40% of research intensive institutions are still using GIF in their review, promotion, and tenure documents. And what's interesting is that they're using it to measure different things, ranging from impact, ranging from quality, um, ranging to importance. But really, sort of the GIF is flawed. You know, it is the average of a skewed distribution. Um, like I mentioned before, it's a journal-based metric. So it's designed to measure journal performance, not individual performance. Um, and it creates perverse incentives within the system. And so that's you know, a big challenge with these journal-based metrics. But I do wanna emphasize that journal-based metrics are not the only challenge with fair and responsible research assessment. So there are cognitive and systems biases excluding researchers from succeeding. Uh, there are other scholarly outputs in addition to research articles that aren't being incentivized. Um, and in most cases, sort of there's a lack of transparency throughout the process. So how is evaluation being conducted? And really when we over rely on journal impact factors, what it's doing is it's discouraging academics um, from working on other activities that are important to the mission of most research institutions, such as teaching, mentoring, and work with societal impact. And I think, you know, that's something that is worth considering is, does the mission and vision of the university really align with how researchers are being assessed? Because um, ultimately, the goal of any organization, organization is to achieve their vision. Um, and academia, that largely happens through the reward system. Okay, so here I'm just, I want to talk a little bit about some of the cognitive and systems biases, because I think this gets mentioned a lot in passing and we're still developing a vocabulary 
for how to talk about biases within the assessment system. Um, and of course, these have been shown to result in inequitable review, promotion, and hiring practices. Um, so I have a link to a one pager that we created on the website. And this was something that Dora developed in collaboration with Ruth Schmidt at the Illinois Institute of Design. Um, and Ruth was another person that we had met at the meeting in October that Dora organized with the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. Um, and so out of that meeting came a wonderful partnership and really the creation of these new resources to think about um, how we can support institutions. So one thing that I wanna emphasize um, as I move on, is that sort of these biases happen at a personal level. So I'm gonna go through a couple of these personal biases, not all of them because it's a lot <laughs> and it would be a lot of information to process, but really thinking about, okay, what are some of these personal biases? And then what are the effects of these personal biases on the system? Um, so what does it mean at both an individual level and a systems level? So the first thing um, that I wanna talk about is anchoring. So anchoring is when the first piece of data that you either see or hear will set the bar against which we judge subsequent pieces of information. So I think a very good and relevant example right now is when people are negatively comparing sort of post-COVID-19 post research productivity um, to the productivity that they had pre-COVID-19. Um, and we all know, of course, that you know, right now there's across the country, you know, there's still um, sort of limited access to lab space, restrictions on how many people can be there. So it's kind of a mismeasure, um, but yet you're still anchored to the idea of how productive people were before the pandemic hit. And you know, this is, becomes a problem because this type of anchor data can then sort of define normal. So what that means is that we're skewing our reference points. So we're emphasizing these relative comparisons rather than looking at what the actual value is. And then the second and last one that I wanna go through is the halo effect. Um, and this of course is when we let impressions of individual attributes influence our overall opinion. So an example of this is when maybe a faculty candidate is coming from a prestigious institution. You know, they're thought to have more potential from someone who's coming from a lesser known university. And of course, you know, we can all see that this is uh, a challenge because we are giving preferential treatment um, to someone sort of based on these inherited qualities, um, which reinforce these equitable or inequitable norms. Um, and this is sort of, causing us to miss out on other worthy candidates. And so I'm not gonna go through the rest of them, but I encourage you to check them out because um, they all have these very specific effects. But yeah, yeah go ahead. Uh, I just wanna comment on this one. Uh, you know, the other part of this uh, uh, halo, halo effect is, is the hierarchical effect that you see uh, within faculty ranks itself. and. Uh, there was a really nice article that came out in the New York Times about uh, Katie Kariko's, the uh, you know career. She, I mean, she's the one who was key in the development of the COVID nineteen vaccine, and she talks about how she was discriminated against uh, simply because she was not a tenured faculty, and and her research was discounted. Uh, because, I mean, I think this is just sort of an example of the halo effect you're talking about. It's not just a prestigious university, it's even within uh, the yeah. university. I just the egos that seem to influence how, you know, one does their research. So just oh, absolutely. I think that's a terrific example. And if I, if I remember the story correctly, because I definitely know the article that you're talking about, she ended up leaving that institution. Yes. Um, which of course is like such a loss of talent for the university. Um, but it, like you said, it manifests in all of these different ways. So I think another um, halo effect might be when you have someone interviewing for a job and there's someone who has a nature paper and then there's someone who has like a series of really good publications 
um, in other journals, but they, it, it's not in the top sort of three. Um, and I come from a biology background. So of course, sort of in my journal hierarchical structure, um, which is untrue would be sort of science nature cell. Um, so even journal name and reputation, or when you think about postdoc hiring, who is the name or the reputation of the advisor that the person trained with? I think that's also influenced. Oh, absolutely. I think it's also quantity versus quality, right? Oh yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. Um, and what's so interesting about these personal biases is, is that they happen at the individual level, but they have implications on the entire institution and on research evaluation systems at large. So in this bias brief, we highlight four different implications. I'm just gonna go over one now. Um, and that is that individual data points can accidentally distract from the whole. And that's kind of the cumulative effect of anchoring and halo, the halo effect. Um, and what we mean by that is that it's really hard to weigh all information equally. Um, and because of that, it gives these initial, or excuse me, what we sometimes like to think of it sh as shiny data points, um, an advantage. So, you know, what can institutions do? Three things um, that we came up with, I'm sure there are others. You know, one, assemble diverse teams to bring a range of perspectives and experiences into decisions. Second, you can look outside your institutions or discipline to broaden what your sense of normal looks like. Um, and three, you know, put reputation-based indicators at the end of application materials to reduce preconceived notions. And this really is a risk mitigation strategy. So at the top of a CV, usually you see name, you see education history, a lot of times you'll see the mentor and it's really easy to make snap judgments of, oh, this person came from X university and trained with a Nobel laureate, whereas this person came from a different university that's you know, not as well known and trained with someone that I'm not quite as familiar with. Um, okay, so can, um, happy to have a little more discussion about this if other people have questions and comments. Like I said, that's kind of a brief snapshot of um, the resource that Dora created. It's called Unintended um, Cognitive and Systems Biases. Um, there are other sort of uh, strategies in there. Yeah, go ahead, Guru. Uh, uh, with, with regard to uh, motion and tenure practices, um, we, we are part of the uh, organization of promotion and tenure innovation and, re and innovation and research. I think it, PTIR is the abbreviation. It's, it, it's, a, it's a funded program started by Rich Carter at Oregon State University. And, and it, it addresses this question of general impact factors and uh, valuing other contributions other than peer-reviewed publications. Uh, I don't know if you're aware of that or if you, if you have uh, participated in that, in, the, in those discussions. Uh, I am not, but I'm definitely writing the name of the program down now. You said it was PTIR? PTIR, and Rich Carter is the, is the person at Oregon State University. Okay. Uh, and I think it would be useful to, to have that input both ways. Mm -hmm. uh, in very similar to Dora, there's actually a, a document that's been signed by 60 different universities about how this is going to implement a change in the value system that you know, universities have. For, oh, for, nice. So, oh, so Guru, who would have, is that something that would have just came through the VPR office then, or is that something the provost initiated? Well, what level at Iowa State what, did we engage with this? Uh, we, it started off with uh, them reaching out. Uh, Rich Carter reached out when I was still in the VPR's office and it started off as a kind of a conversation we were having because I, I uh, head up the, uh, the uh, i core activities on campus. And so then it was, uh, uh, it was a triumvirate of people. Uh, it was a Donna, uh, sorry, uh, Don Brash Prince and 
me uh, who, who represented the university. And so those things are happening in real time. It started about a year and a half ago and we, we, we meet, at least I haven't participated in recent meetings, but we meet every few months. Uh, so I would, maybe you want to talk with Don about this, uh, Curtis. Yeah, excellent. And Anna, I was going to ask real quick, maybe you're going to get into this, but like when you're talking about restructuring like a CV and you're actually pushing some of those, you know, those prestigious affiliation things down. So that's not the first thing being considered. An institution that's that's actually done this, will they just provide like a CV template? So for applicants, here is our template, here's how it needs to be organized. Is that how that actually takes place? I would think it would have to, you'd have to tell them how to do this, right? For someone submitting application materials, for example. Yeah, and so one example of this is the, I believe it was the Yale, was it Yale B, B and B. So I think it was like their um, biology, molecular biology, biophysics department. Um, and they, so they, they went a step further where they asked all of their applicants to completely blind their applications. So, you know, they didn't have their names, but they also didn't have the names of their advisors. Any, all names of academic institutions were removed and um, all journal names were removed. Um, so you could sort of list your publications, um, but I think they were, they were doing this to sort of focus more on, you know, what is the description of your contribution to, to that research product or research output. Um, and so for that, they gave sort of really strict guidance, I believe. I also know there are a number of research funders right now, particularly in Europe, that are switching from the traditional CV format into what's called a narrative um, or structured CV format. Um, and that does two things. So one, it allows researchers and applicants to sort of talk about the merit of their contributions to provide context, because um, there's a lot of information that numbers can't capture. So this is really thought to sort of be seen as a balance for that, um, but they have it in a structured way. So it's sort of like, what is your contribution to, mm -hmm. um, I think one, one is like research um, or the creation of knowledge is how, how it's termed, but it's really research. And then you're able to sort of like talk about what you've done and you can mention sort of your papers, but you're not focusing on where it was published or the reputation. You're really talking about what is the content of that contribution. Um, now, of course, I, a big concern of this is language and gender biases um, and even um, sort of, you know, if someone is a native speaker of that language or not. Um, so DOOR is organizing a workshop specifically for research funders at the end of September, um, hearing from linguistics experts and gender bias experts really to start to sort of untangle, you know, how can we optimize narrative CV formats to reduce and reduce do some bias mitigation with that too. Because um, that definitely is a concern that we're very um, keen to work through um, as well. So and I, I think I probably went on a tangent. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, go ahead, Guru. And I remember, and Curtis might remember this as well, that at the workshop, uh, HHMI had presented their vision for how to do this. And they were talking about not so much about where the papers were published as much as what impact those, the, the research has had in the last four or five years. And that narrative was important in their decisions for promotion and tenure. And I, I think that's the kind of model that the Europeans are going towards too. And, and just another question for you. Um, you know, we talk so much about all of these decisions and culture change happening at the institutional level, but predominantly it encompasses administration and faculty, right? I, but I think we, we probably need to step back and go to the next generation, which are going to become faculty which is the graduate students. 
what are we doing to empower them or educate them about these kinds of issues? I mean, it's such a vicious cycle that they're caught up in, right? They're graduate students, their, their, their mentors think, okay, you need to publish in nature and PNAS and science. So they are wedded to this idea. They go on to become exactly the same clones uh, the, uh, of their mentors. So I think there needs to be uh, some effort towards the, the grassroots, you know, to develop mm -hmm. that. So is, is Dora doing anything about that? Yeah, so great question. Um, we're working on it um, in a couple of sort of slight, slightly different ways. So I think one great way is that we're documenting case studies of institutional change at academic institutions. Um, so we have a bunch on our website and you can find them under the case studies tab. And what we're learning from those is kind of, you know, what, what does implementation look like? So the goal of these case studies really wasn't to be like, what's good practice? Um, but it was more to be like, how did this good practice come to be in the first place? Like, what did you do to get there? Who was involved? What were the specific steps? Um, and I think a couple good sort of lessons learned from those case studies were the Dutch National Sort of Rewards and Recognition Program mm -hmm. is, and of course, you know, it's, it's easy to create an international or a national consortium um, in countries like the Netherlands, because I believe they have 14 universities. So getting consensus among yeah, 14 easy. universities yeah. is easier, right? Yeah. Um, and all of, all of that work. But one specific example within that is, um, uh, I'm racking my brain, it's either the University of Utrecht or, um, the University Medical Center Utrecht. I can find the link and sort of send it to Abby to share with others later if they're interested. Okay. Um, but they actually created a early, it's like an early career like incubator or like innovator entrepreneur type hub. Mm -hmm. um, and so they created their own sort of policy type club <laughs> that did a bunch of like advocacy and campaigning on campus that was like everyone's thinking about promotion and tenure yeah but for graduate school yeah. we still have to publish like a specific number of papers and this makes no sense so this is how we would prefer to be evaluated not on what we publish but like are we developing critical thinking skills do we have um the skills necessary to like find future careers like are we competent in our field? Um, so their work and advocacy actually led to rewriting of how graduate of policy for graduate evaluation in their department. And that model of how they did it was so successful that it's been picked up by other departments across campus. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a beautiful example of the sort of bottom up and top down change. Yeah, you know, I mean, when I was thinking about the grassroots and we talk about papers and, uh, and really it's about what impact that knowledge has had on society, right? And yeah. that's, that's the yardstick that needs to be used uh, to measure. And I don't think that we are training our graduate students to think along those lines. Uh, and I, 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 I honestly think that we need to perhaps rethink on how a dissertation is even written. Uh, I mean, it's, 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 it's in, you know, it's for years and years and hundreds of years, dissertations have been written exactly the same way. Uh, and we have never asked our, our students, regardless of whether they're in the STEM disciplines or the humanities, write one page at the end of your dissertation that says what impact your research has had on society. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, if we make them think about, okay, I know what equations to use and what algorithms to develop, which probably means something to people within their own field, doesn't mean anything to the rest of society, then you're beginning to make them think along those lines that you're talking about, which is impact and not so much 
publications in, in these high profile journals. And yeah, Anna, you have a, there was a question put in the chat talking about another uh, type of bias between disciplines from, uh, is it JASIC? Yeah, feel free to unmute if you want to elaborate on that. But he was talking about within a department uh, that has engineers and, uh, and, and engineers and the more science faculty and the, the conflicts that are there when they collaborate. Oh yeah. There's, so yeah, super interesting question. There is, so another thing that Dora does, we have the case studies on our website. That's kind of like, how did this institutional change happen? Um, but we also have a resource library where we curate interesting policy papers, tools um, that universities can help, can use to sort of create their own um, policies, good practices. And one of them is called Tenzing. And what I like about that is that it's based off of the contributor roles taxonomy. So I'm not sure if you folks are familiar with credit. Um, so of course, with authorship, um, and I think this is what you're getting to here, Jason, and hopefully I'm pronouncing your name correctly, um, is that a lot of times sort of authorship also has these stereotypical associations depending on the field. So, um, in my field that I come from sort of biology, for the first author position is the one who does the most work. And then the last author is um, the PI of the lab. And then the middle authors, you know, you contributed probably the second author more than the third, but you just sort of take it for that. And what this taxonomy does is really breaks down into, you know, what specific roles did each person do? So who helped write the manuscript, who um, did the experiments, who had the idea generation from the experiments, who created reagents, who did data analysis, who revised the manuscript. Um, so that's what the contributor roles taxonomy does. And what this tool Tenzing does um, is it allows you before a project starts, or after it started to have those conversations with collaborators to sort of say, this is how, where I think um, my role is. Um, and so it can facilitate some of those stickier conversations. And I'm not quite sure if that answers your question. So please feel free to um, jump in, but I think that's absolutely like certainly a bias that happens. So, so if I may just, you know, just to um, talk about this uh, disciplinary bias between, for example, engineers that work or, and collaborate you know, with, uh, with our colleagues at science department. So we have uh, decades of, you know, very uh, strong collaborations. We are, we feel like we are open and we bring the value to the table, we see things as an engineers with maybe a bigger perspective than sort of fundamental, you know, detailed science. And I've been in you know, many conversations with my colleagues here at, at my home engineering department where we, you know, the, the sentiments were floated that our colleagues said, for example, sort of our big partner animal science department kind of look at us as technicians yeah. <laughs> and only reach out to us if they need, need something to be fixed per se. And, you know, where, whereas we would appreciate perhaps uh, being asked earlier in the process and being uh, perhaps more of an equal footing as partners. And you know the the publication and the taxonomy of publications that's sort of on the end of the process. But you know yeah. here we're talking about actually perhaps re readjusting where you know where where we start <laughs> or if we start. Yeah, and I think that that's a really good point, and that comes to sort of something that I'll just like move forward a couple of slides. Um, so 
One of the things that I wanted to talk about um, was a new rubric that Dora created, um, again, sort of with, oops, went a little bit too trigger happy with my space button, <laughs> um, to really think about supporting institutional change. And one of the first foundational steps is really aligning on values and goals for research assessment. Um, and we had the, the rubric was developed with a bunch of folks. Um, so 75 individuals in 26 countries and six continents. And then we had it piloted uh, by seven individuals at um, universities who occupied different roles. So one was a dean. We had a graduate student to look at it. Um, we also had pre-tenure for faculty, um, policy makers and research makers within the university look at it. Um, and one of the first things that we learned was that it's really important to do that alignment step first. Um, so before you start creating policies or finding solution, really figuring out sort of what are our shared goals and what are our shared values for assessment. And I, I think and sort of hope that this is sort of getting to your point where when you start, you kind of want to create space to, to come to that alignment. And I think, you know, one of those shared goals, you know, is sort of respect for everyone's contributions to research. Um, so hopefully I think that captures your point. It looks like Eric has his hand raised, if you have something to add. Yeah, thank you. Um, so this is going back to the CV and, and removing the journal names from the CV mm -hmm. um, and assessment and not relying on the package that the, the article was, was published in, but the, instead the article itself. Um, and I'm curious your thoughts or kind of emerging best practices on including citation counts or any sort of evaluative metrics. So what information is included in these kind of um, not really blinded CVs, but um, is it just the actual like paper reference in APA format or is there some sort of quote unquote impact? And that, that yeah. opens up a whole nother can of worms of where are you measuring the citations from or what is appropriate to use, field normalized, et cetera. Yeah, good, all, all really good points. So I can't specifically recall back to how you, um, the Yale department had blinded theirs. Um, and what information was and was not allowed. Um, I can say, so Dora, of course, advocates for a holistic approach. So you can take sort of this port, like a port, looking at someone's sort of portfolio rather than focusing on one single metric. I think the importance here is really understanding what the metrics can and cannot measure. Um, so for example, the relative citation ratio is one that came out of NIH recently. And this is looking at article performance. Um, and it's field normalized in that they look at sort of your reference list and the references of your reference list to compare performance of citations. But the challenge with this specific metric is that <laughs> it's like it takes years to acquire the number. So I think it's like you need three years for the citations to accrue. So if you're a postdoc going out on the job market, you don't necessarily have that time. And there's also the challenge of citations. You know, some there are a lot of highly cited papers that are highly cited um, because people are pointing out sort of an experimental flaw or um, sort of the, or a, like a negative. Right, negative not all way. citations are good citations. Yeah. Exactly, and I think there's also, um, I can't remember the name of this bias, but it's some citations become highly cited um, because actually I think it's the Matthew effect, right? So the rich get rather richer. So when you think of like a Google search, the stuff that's at the top 
is going to get more hits because it's already at the top. So that happens with citation or some search engines too for research articles. Yeah, I, I, I just wondered, you know, also in these blinded CVs is um, if there's no sort of, I don't want to say measure of impact, but maybe indication of impact, however imperfect that is, it might even, yeah. it might even, um, you know, incentivize the quantity again over the quality. Because if, if I'm yeah. just saying, here's my papers, but, um, you know, having 12 papers is better than three, I don't know, unless those three papers yeah. are very impactful, but then how do you prove that? So there's exactly. no answer here, but. <laughs> no, definitely not a, definitely not a, a great one for sure. And it, what I see is with the narrative CV is by providing that space to say sort of like, what is the societal impact of your work? It gives a chance to show that um, in ways, because there are some, there's a really great article in sort of nature talking about the societal impacts of research and how you can have big societal impact with a paper that doesn't necessarily have a lot of citations. So one example of that was, there was a, I believe a computer science researcher in the Middle East who had created a app um, where when women were being harassed on the street, they could just like put a pin down and it would mark the location of where, where that happened. Um, and the app became very popular and they were able to identify like these are big hotspots where women are being harassed. And one of them was the university. Um, and because of this, the university had a brand new um, harassment policy that they put in place. And so it wasn't a highly cited paper, but it had a huge impact on the women at that university and in that town. Um, so that I think is something that could be illuminated in a narrative CV. When you think about how to evaluate those types of CVs, uh, we're looking at the use of rubrics and assessment matrices. And so what that sort of does is sort of instill sort of, you have the sort of structure from the CV where all of the categories are being, you're, all um, of the applicants are being assessed across the same category. And then the evaluation sort of is also happening along the same broad standards. Um, but it's the development sort of of those rubrics that are really sort of institutionally dependent. And Anna, just a quick time check. We've got about 15 more minutes. Oh, nice. Okay. So I can go through a little bit of this rubric and then I have one case study at, so I guess actually maybe Curtis, I'll ask you what would be more helpful. So I can walk through the space rubric or even do a very sort of shortened introduction, or I can talk about a case study that we have from the Open University in Catalonia. And that also sort of has concrete steps of what they did on campus to lead to reform. Yeah, I like the idea of like just a quick run through on the rubric and then hearing some of those concrete steps that another university took. I think that'd be a great way to wrap this up. Wonderful. Okay. Um, so two things with the rubric. Why did we do it? <laughs> One, we wanted to help institutions analyze the outcomes of interventions to improve academic assessment. So we already had created the cognitive and systems biases brief. And we also had created five design principles to help institutions get started on assessment. Um, but as we were creating those, we realized that a lot of it was encouraging institutions to experiment with their own policies and practices. And we didn't really want to do that without also being able to help them figure out how to analyze um, the outcomes of these experiments, right? So that was a big driving motivator. And also this really, you know, core to DORA is to supporting the development of new practices and help catalyzing change. So that's where the motivation came from. I already mentioned it was a very participatory process. Um, and briefly just to go through, you know, the first insight gained 
is that when we were developing this and talking to members of the community, we realized that it was important to look beyond just individual interventions because it's really the institutional conditions and infrastructure that determine whether or not those interventions are going to be successful. And so you really need those institutional capabilities. So there are two ways that the space rubric can be used, either to establish a baseline, um, and that's kind of what I was mentioning before, to be able to, or not, sorry, this was not what I was mentioning before, but so first, it really can help create a state of play. So what are the current state of conditions? And then secondly, it can be used in this retroactive analysis, and that's what I was talking about. Um, so being able to diagnose how institutional infrastructure might have influenced the outcomes of a specific intervention. So it's really you know, meant to be a reflective exercise to help inform future strategy. So we defined five institutional capabilities as being important, um, and they include things like standards for scholarship, um, process mechanics and policies, accountability, um, and I think this one is huge because policies are only important um, if they are being implemented. So how do you create a culture of accountability within the institution? And building off that, of course, then is the culture. Um, and then evaluative and iterative feedback, knowing that research assessment reform is never really finished. Um, how do you maintain that growth mindset? And then on the other axis, we have is sort of these evolving institutional capabilities. So we recognize that institutions are natu naturally at different stages or readiness of research assessment reform. So thinking about, you know, what do you do when you're first getting started within a specific capability to really scaling up, you know, across departments and then eventually to sort of across the entire university. Um, and this is just to emphasize that because institutions are all at different stages of readiness, um, what the activities that you might focus on when you're just starting out are going to be different than what you're focusing on at the end. Okay, and then now I just want to quick go through this case study at the University of Catalonia. Um, so the history and academic culture at UOC is rooted in open science. Um, it is in the name of the institution. And because of that, there were a lot of internal drivers really to push career progression um, and recruitment evaluations to be more open. And they also wanted to identify ways to reward um, societal impacts of research. And the effort really got started. It was fantastic. I had an email from a staff in the, I believe it was International Relations Department who reached out asking if um, Dora had sort of guidance for universities. And it was within a week after starting my job at Dora. So of course the answer had to be not yet, but there will be. Um, and it really turned into this you know, great being able to sort of follow their progress. Um, so the staff member and other researchers had this sort of grassroots advocacy where they went to the research and innovation committee and said, you know, we think door is important. We think responsible research is important. And we'd like to sort of re-envision what the campus does. And um, the vice president for research said, you're right let's go ahead and create a task force um, and we're going to sort of examine this. So it was a combination of sort of bottom up um, really to sort of get the energy to get started and then top down where you had people in positions of power saying, absolutely, let's do this. We're going to start with a task force. So the first step of the task force was to do a lot of background research and then to bring it back to the committee to say, you know, this is why I think we should sign door or why we shouldn't do. Um, and uh, they ended up opting to sort of sign Dora and go through this assessment reform process. Um, 
I should emphasize that different institutions um, operate in different national and international contexts. So in Catalonia, there's a centralization of career progression for faculty nationally. Um, and because of that, sort of the new assessment criteria that they were able to develop applies to postdoctoral fellows and their research staff, um, not the professors, because the professors are being evaluated by this national agency. Okay, so the first thing that the task force did, um, besides the background research, was to develop an action plan. And this really helps them to align on their goals. And it was, it's really comprehensive. So it has sort of a timeline, you know, what they aim to achieve, what their sub goals are. And in addition to sort of, a, you know, creating this vision by having this action plan that was published, it's also being able to be used as a communication tool for the university. And then sort of in terms of what they changed was they shifted from those journal-based metrics for postdoctoral recruitment to the narrative discussion of achievements. And so the task force was really pivotal for capacity building here, um, both in terms of defining what those achievements were, but also in designing rubrics to guide the evaluator. So there's consistency across the evaluation. So this task force played a very big role. And then um, they also were really important for advocacy and community engagement um, to help explain the new processes across the university and then ensure that evaluation would be consistent. Um, so there was a lot, a big training component that happened here. And then the last thing that I kind of touched on, um, but want to come back to is this action plan covered a lot of ground for them. So it, it certainly served as well as an accountability mechanism and a way for them to be transparent about their goals. Um, so here I just have a snapshot from part of it um, where they have sort of specific areas and then you know what their goal is for 2019, what their goal was for 2020. Um, and so I'm happy to pause there and then just take the last five minutes for questions. I apologize, I kind of sped through a lot of that material, um, hoping to get it all in, but I hope some of it stuck with you as well. No, that was all great. Anna, can I ask one quick question, which is, yeah. who would you point to in the US who might be on the progressive edge with, with some of this, the leading edge with some of this? That's a good one. I definitely think, um... <laughs> oh, I know the name of the institution and now, of course, under pressure, it has um, slipped, um, but, I think you see the UC system and UC Berkeley has a lot of really interesting um, approaches to assessment. So their office for um, faculty equity and welfare has created sort of rubrics and ideas for how to measure contributions to equity and inclusion, um, which I think is really powerful. Um, they also have recommendations about including graduate students and postdocs on some hiring committees, not necessarily to have a vote, um, but just to be a part of this process. And this, you know, just two things. One, sort of it brings in um, more diverse perspectives. Uh, of course, you know, there are insights that graduate students have that faculty might not, but are still are valuable, of course. Um, and it also, you know, the faculty hiring process is pretty opaque. Um, so for postdocs going into it, it's kind of what you hear through the grapevine. So this is one way to get them familiar with the process. Um, and then I think another 
place in the US would be, it's a really long university name, so bear with me, but Indiana University, Purdue University, Indiana, so like IUPUI. Um, and what they did was they created a brand new path to tenure that is focused on contributions to equity and inclusion, um, which I think is you know very novel. And it mirrors some of the things that I've been seeing happening in Europe. Um, you know, because of you know very different sort of policy <coughs> environments, I think Europe is pretty far ahead of the United okay. States in responsible assessment. Yeah. Um, but what I'm seeing there is the creation of sort of new tenure tracks um, where faculty are able to decide, okay, I'm going to be research oriented. Um, so, you know, that's going to be the bulk of my tenure. And then teaching and societal contributions, you know, might come at different. Whereas others are able to sort of select, you know, I want this public engagement tenure track. Um, where that's sort of the focus. That all sounds great. Guru, did you have a, a comment there? Oh, we have a minute left and I was wondering, uh, Anna, what, what, what is Dora thinking about team, team science where you, know, you have publications with 15 different authors in it? And when you talk about impact and contributions, how what is what is what is the solution there? I mean, you know, it's a real challenge in promotion and tenure to evaluate uh, the credentials of somebody who is uh, author number seven in a fifteen author publication. Yeah, I I think visual tools are going to be pretty important. And I'm going to drop a link into the chat, but so I was talking about the contributor roles taxonomy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so, you know, you can apply that to papers. I think you can also apply that to CVs. Um, and I think that's able to show you a little bit more about what um, a person, a person has done. And I think creating that visual elements, kind of like that link that I just dropped in the chat. Okay. Um, it also, because people like metrics because they're fast. Um, yeah. And this also is able to sort of be sort of like a fast assessment, like, oh, okay, here's how they've contributed across a series of papers over time. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they did a lot of experiments, they did a lot of, you know, writing, or this person did a lot of that. Um, and you're able, even able, I think, to sort of track that professional development growth, um, or you're having more. It's, it's especially it. important for postdoctoral candidates, I think. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much. Yeah, with that, we are at time. Anna, this has been just fantastic. And just yeah. double checking, um, can we get your slides to share out with folks? Oh yeah, absolutely. And I'm happy to. I'll sort of drop the link in the chat for the space rubric. Yeah, that's um, great. But that's yeah, great of course. One. Wonderful. Well, th thank you very much uh, for your time today. This is this has been wonderful, and thanks to everyone for attending. And and Guru, I'll probably reach out and follow up with you. Maybe on yeah, we, I look forward to uh, for the chat on this. This was very interesting. And uh, thank you, Anna. It was good seeing you again. Yes, wonderful to bye -bye. see you too. Bye -bye. Thanks, everybody. Bye bye.